I just learned that you guys target high school kids to actually attend this luncheon, which is kind of cool, but I never got that memo when I was in high school. Um, matter of fact, one of the fun things we do at Carson is we talk about Creighton and Nebraska. And what I tell Creighton kids when they come in and work with us is you couldn't get into Nebraska, so you had to settle for Creighton. Now, <laughs> we all know that's not true. By the way, I travel all over the United States, and people know of Creighton. They talk about Creighton, and the, the talent that we get out of Creighton is, is second to none. We really appreciate it. And we appreciate the partnership, Dean, uh, with yourself and with Creighton. It's been fantastic. Every time I give a talk, I want to make sure that you're getting a return on your time. So I've got a goal today. I got a minimum goal and a maximum goal. And at a bare minimum, I want every one of you, whether you are a student or not, I want to give you something, a high impact idea that you can implement in your life and you'll see results. If I run into you six months from now, you'll go, Ron, I took it, it's working exactly the way you said it was going to work. My bigger goal, which will only happen to a very few of you in the room, this happened to me when I was a junior in high school, is you're going to hear something, it's going to hit you just right, and it's going to be something you're going to carry with you for the rest of your life that will serve you give you a hint of what that is, is I want you just to go through something for me real quick, a quick exercise. I want you to take your right hand and raise it as high as you can. Keep it up. Higher. All right, put them down. Now, when I said raise your right hand as high as you can, why on earth, when I said higher, did you raise it higher? Anybody consciously say, I know he's going to ask for more, so I'm going to hold just a little bit back? <laughs> Nobody did that, right? And that's the big lesson that I want you to at least walk out of here today, is every single day we get up, we compete against our own potential. Most days we come up short. And giving just a little more can yield an enormous amount of results for you, your family, the people you serve, whatever company you might work with. And this happened to me. I went into the Army when I was a junior in high school. They had a program called the Buddy Program in Nebraska. And I was a pretty good salesman. And I convinced 10 of, I, I grew up just north of here, I convinced 10 other uh, guys in my class to go in with me. So. I entered automatically a PFC, private first class E3, if you know what that means. And I was like, wow, this is really, this is really neat. Uh, I got pretty homesick, though, when I, when I went off to Fort Knox, Kentucky. I had not really been away from home and certainly hadn't been away from my mother. <laughs> Even as a junior, that was hard for me to do. But what I remember, and I'll never forget, it was a room about this size. And we had, we're in reception station and we're getting ready for basic training. And by the way, it's a scary time. I mean, you show up, you've been bussed there, it's hot, it's humid, it's in the summer. They issue you these green wool blankets that you're gonna actually be required to sleep under even though it's like 90 degrees in the room. And it just started right then and you could just hear all kinds of people chanting far away from the physical activity they're doing. And they didn't care, they get you up at two, three, four o'clock in the morning to actually go out and run, do push-ups, set-ups, whatever they wanted you to do. But getting back to all of us were afraid, we were terrified, we had these drill sergeants, and we practiced standing for about 10 minutes. When I walked in the room, the sergeant major, who was in charge of our reception, how we actually did and where we went off to a boot camp, was to be highly respected. He was a sergeant major. He stood up, practiced, we were silent the entire time. But then he gave a talk that to this day I still think about as I apply it to my life. And that is, and it's today, it's true today, even so, more so than I think then in, in 1982. He said, our society doesn't really 
expect much, unfortunately. He said, if you give just a little more, and he asked to give 10%, if you give 10% more, you will have absolutely anything that you want in this world. And you can look at the stats. We call it EDM, Exponential Difference Maker. It's something we talked about in one of our original books in 2005. And I went back and looked and did some studies on data about what kind of difference would 10% make. Wow, 10% is a lot. But you don't need to give 10 if you just give three. And I used to golf in those days. I loved to golf. And if you take a look at the top golfer versus someone that scores 3% higher, 3% more rounds, the difference in what they make is about 10,000%. You can go do it and just look at it. It's one missed putt, it's one out of bounds, it's just one little item that has an enormous impact. So when you walk out of here today, I want you to say, I'm going to be committed because the society and service and effort is not going up, it's actually going the other direction. So if you as an individual can say, I'm going to fight that, I'm actually going to go the other direction, you will stand out. You will stand out and you'll have more fun and be more effective in everything that you do in life. That's actually me, all those pictures. Um, I was a sophomore in high school, then off to, I'm 18 years old there fishing in Canada. There's my boot camp. I was a uh, tanker on an M60A1 tank. Anybody see stripes, by the way? That's, why I, that's actually where I went. I did that obstacle course, that confidence course. I'm also a practical joker, so I like to have a lot of fun. Matter of fact, those teeth, um, we, we, Jeannie and I, my wife, we hosted a thing at our, at our house for people we had never met, and I stood in the foyer as they were walking in with those teeth in, and it drove her crazy, right? But we, we, we like to have. We, we have one of the things that we talk about at Carson, and by the way, we don't have, people ask me, how many people work for you, Ron? And the answer is, right over here, Carson, zero. Because nobody works for me, everybody works with me. And culturally, we don't refer to, you're gonna hear me talk about internal stakeholders. We do not have employees, we don't have staff, we have internal stakeholders, and we all work together. I just think it's, you know, a staff or employees like us versus them. So this is really something when you get to, we have a different nomenclature, uh, really, around Carson. So as you heard me refer to that. A little bit of history about me. I grew up on a farm just north of here, Tecama, an hour north. How many of you even know where Tecama is? Yeah, just a few of you. And I thought I was going to be a farmer my entire life. And my parents in 1982 uh, went broke farming. And interest rates, to give you some perspective, interest rates were 21.5%. Paul Volcker was our Fed chairman, and it was a pretty tough time to be in farming. And I remember my dad saying, Ronnie, I can't even support you and your sister. You're going to have to find something else to do. That was pretty scary, thinking you knew what your career track was in your entire life, and all of a sudden it changes. And shortly thereafter, I was in the library reading Money Magazine. And Money Magazine listed top professions for the future. And right at the top of the list was become a financial advisor, more specifically a CFP, a Certified Financial Planner, I thought, well, at least I can probably wear a suit and tie. Growing up on the farm, you had oil and dirt over. Even after you showered, you did. And I thought, God, I could dress up if I was a financial advisor. And so that's what I did. I went down to Nebraska. And literally, out of 11 Able, I started cold calling. That's how this all, out of a phone book. This is how this literally all started in 1983. By the way, a quick little interesting side note. I was at the Napa Valley Wine Auction three years ago. I was in a setting similar to this. A lady said, where are you from, Nebraska? What do you do? Financial advisor. Um, how did you choose that profession? I told her that story. And she looked at me and she says, I wrote that article. Talk, it gives me quivers down my spine whenever I say that. She said, I wrote that article. I was with Money Magazine. I said, well, then I guess I owe you my entire career. Because that was the article that actually, that actually moved me. And here's what I'll tell you. Here I am, and I'm unconscious, incompetent. I didn't know anything. And you're, many of you are going to leave, and you're going to go out into the workplace, and you're going to be an unconscious, incompetent. A lot of the stuff that you're learning now is really just teaching you how to learn. And the real learning is going to start when you get out there. 
Another point I love to make is if you apply everything in your life with confidence, conviction, enthusiasm, just being excited about what you do is going to take you far. So give it a little extra, 3% extra. You have anything you want. Have confidence, conviction, enthusiasm. Matter of fact, when you do that, it's contagious and great things start to happen. So thinking about every day, what can I do a little better and how can I just bring it? The other thing I would tell you is have a brain trust. Have people that you, know, you can count on. We all know who Warren Buffett is. Uh, another mentor of mine in Omaha here is a gentleman by the name of Howard Hawks. Many of you probably heard of him. One of the best advice I ever received from my brain trust, and Howard specifically, early on, he said, Ron, find the brightest people you can and get the heck out of their way. For those of you that will own businesses someday and you bring in internal stakeholders, don't make the mistake I made, by the way, I made lots of them, and think that you can get a bargain when it comes to talent. There is no such thing. If somebody's out there and they're quote unquote a deal, then there's, some, there's a reason why. You can't pay great people enough in alignment of interest, so you're all pulling in the same direction. Culturally, make sure that there's a fit, but really, really, Focus and take your time. We'd at Carson would rather have nobody in, in a certain position than the wrong person in that position. Don't think you need to be a librarian of info, or a library of information, but rather a librarian. You're gonna, there's just too much information to know out there. You, know, you have some core beliefs culturally, know where you're going, think about that, have long term goals. What we love to say is live your life by design, not by default. And there's an exercise I'd ask you to go through. And I actually have a book called Sustainable Edge. Anybody wants a copy, I'd be more than happy to give it to you. But in it's a blueprinting process. And it's about going 20 years into the future. And I know for many of you, that's a large percentage of your life. But it's a healthy exercise to go through the blueprinting and then to set goals and go 20 years into the future and just imagine, okay, well, how old you're going to be. That you'll know. Maybe you're going to be married. You might even have a kid or two by then. Try to put yourself visually in that space. And then go through and list goals. Professional, personal, family goals. The other piece of advice I would give is don't sacrifice everything else for your, personal, for, for your business and your professional. Personal goals. You have to be selfish to be selfless. You have to take care of yourself first. And here's another thing with business that is not, I believe, uh, commonly believed, and I've seen it play out time and time again, is balance leads to growth, and growth leads to balance. And they're a positive, virtuous cycle, and they literally feed on one another. So when you think about that, you don't want to kill yourself, but you want to have these long-term goals, and you want to make sure that they're balanced. And then here's the other thing I would tell you, is when you set a goal, believe that there's a 50-50 chance of accomplishing that goal. If you sincerely believe that, you're going to accomplish about 80% of your goals. And you go 20, you do 15, you'll do uh, 10, 5, 3, and 1. And this is where it gets interesting. Now you've got a one-year goal. And I want you, every night before you go to bed, list the six most important items you need to get done in order of priority before you go to the next item. I want you to think about this. You've got these goals that are 20 years into the future, they're all connected to your other goals, and they show up in a one-year goal, and then it drives your daily activity, because you're going to get overwhelmed with the whirlwind of life, and figure out what's important. Get rid of the word busy. How many of you have said, I'm so busy, even just today? It's really a matter, right? We all have the same 24 hours in the day. So really, I want you to replace busy with, when you say, I can't get to the gym because I'm so busy, I want you to say, I can't get to the gym because it's just not a priority. Or I didn't do this because it's not a priority. And the six most vital one, like what are the six most important things? And a vital one for the week is a theme. What am I falling behind on in these goals that I said was important for the year? Here's the other thing. When you go to bed at night, your subconscious mind will start to work on solutions. It's amazing. Mind experts used to say for every bit of information we had in our conscious mind, we had 15 billion bits in our subconscious mind. That's quite the ratio. Now they're saying that's not true, that our minds are growing so fast and information is coming in so fast that we can't even measure the amount that it is. So imagine 
when you're sleeping and you've written those goals out in order of priority that your conscious mind is interacting with your subconscious mind and it's like a Google bot. It's out there and all of a sudden you'll see opportunities that you didn't see before. And when you get distracted, this process gives you the ability to act when motivation isn't present or someone's distracting you away from that, you can come back and you can get started again. Sometimes you get so overwhelmed that you're spinning your wheels all over the place. The other advice I would give you is, and you can't, some of you aren't gonna be able to do this day one, but I promise you can work toward this and you can get there sooner than you think you can. I'm often asked, Ron, uh, why do you work so hard? It's like, I don't work. I haven't worked since I was age 36. And I define that as the day I woke up and said, I get to do the things I love to do versus the things I have to do. If you work on your weaknesses, what are you going to have someday? A lot of strong weaknesses. Take your strengths, take what you love, go with that. It might be a very, very few things, but be the best you can possibly be and surround yourself with others, going back to what Howard Hawks said, surround yourself with the brightest people you can find. And guess what? What you aren't good at and you don't love will absolutely be their passion and what they love. I like to fly. I like to climb. I like to hunt. All of these are things that I integrate into my daily activity, whether it's business, work, or play. I was doing a mountain bike trip in Moab, Utah earlier this year and with 15 other guys, and we got to talking, and we were talking about my travel schedule, and they go, oh my gosh, your travel, I was on like a 17 city, literally over two and a half weeks run, and they go, is that work or is that play? I said, I don't know, you decide. It's all just living to me. So put yourself in a position where you get to live life. You'll be more productive, you'll enjoy life, and don't just accept what you have. You or the, you control your own destiny, you can make it happen. I want to talk about our core values at Carson. These are important. And by the way, we apply our core values first internally, and then we look at core values externally. Client first. The client's interest comes first always. Now, that's easy to say. How many of you have ever worked with an organization that talks about their clients Right? And it's all about the client. And then you have a totally different experience than that. Well, we apply it first to our internal stakeholders. We need to take care of internal stakeholders. Here's how we think about it at Carson. Internal stakeholders first, then our clients, then making a profit. How many of you heard the client's always right? Right? Client's not always right. Sometimes you have to defend your people because the client, and there's no client that's worth it to your business if they're not treating your people with respect, kindness, and, the, and, and really treating them no different than they would treat the founder or owner of an organization. So take care. We do a lot to reinvest internally back into the culture at Carson. Then let's think about the client, the consumer. At Carson, we're a fiduciary. We're required by law to put the client's interest first. How many of you in the room actually know the difference between a fiduciary and a broker? A handful. If you walk out of this room today and you understand this for the rest of your life, you're going to be ahead of 99% of the people out there. I literally spoke to 200 plus CEOs earlier this year. I asked that question. Not one of them could get it right. I normally get about one person out of 10 talks that can actually explain the difference between a fiduciary and a broker. But just let me leave this with you because it, it, to me it's embarrassing for financial services. Is when I'm a fiduciary, I have to put your interest first, but as a broker, I don't. The only requirement in financial services is suitability. Suitability means if you're suitable for the investment, my loyalty doesn't lie with you. It lies with the organization that I actually work for. And as long as I disclose that we could do something to you or charge you something within a thing called a prospectus. Anybody read a prospectus before? It's like a, lots of pages of legalese. You're not going to understand anything that's actually in there. And it's just wrong. That's why as an RIA, you're not required to give a prospectus because by law, we're required to put your interests first. Number two, third level of trust. Anticipate needs and deliver. 
How do we do that with stakeholders? Thinking about things they're not thinking of. Whether it's we're moving into a new office campus, uh, we're going to be one of, the, one of the only, I think, in town, we're going to provide daycare right there. It's a big deal. We're going to have a trainer. We're going to have a fitness center. We're going to have lots of amenities to reinvest back into our internal stakeholders. The third level of trust for clients is, we call it the third dimension of trust. The first dimension of trust in our business is, are we going to steal your money? Right? How many of you log on to your account and you're, just for a moment, you're relieved that the money's there? As humans, we do. We, you go, ha, ah, wow, I'm glad it's there. Then you immediately go, how am I actually doing this since it's there? It's a pretty easy hurdle to get over today because you're at a, a reputable firm, whether it's a, you know, a Fidelity, a Schwab, a TD, who's one of our wonderful partners that's actually here as well. Um, so easy hurdle. The second hurdle is a little tougher. 65% of Americans don't trust financial services. 65%. It was 69 during the depth of the financial crisis. We haven't improved much. And it's a wonder when you read about these huge fines that the Wells Fargo's of the world and others are paying and continue to pay. So 65%, that's, that's a hurdle. Only 35% are getting over that. But the third and the holy grail at which we try to operate at Carson will continue to move deeper into this. And by the way, Artificial intelligence is going to be bigger than anybody in this room thinks. I don't care how bullish you are, it's going to change it because it's also going to allow us to anticipate things that you don't even think about today and get out ahead of it. We're big on, by the way, data is a new world currency. Clean data is a new world currency. Cars are making big investments into data warehouses, data lakes, in order to capitalize on this. And it is a little bit the big brother and behavior. We're watching everything you're doing. We started, I think, uh, Andrew, what, 14 million data points just since June, you know, just tracking and measuring behavior of, of people. But it's a big deal. Third, care factor. Give it your all even when it's not convenient for you to do so. I said earlier I was a pilot and there's a coach back east who's had a fair amount of success in football. His name is Bill Belichick. He's a head coach, right? You've heard of him before? Okay. And, uh, and I actually flew him in, and he was talking to the team. This was back when Rex Burkhead was there, and these kids were all so intimidated. And, and he, Belichick gets up, and he gives a little talk, and, and he says, any questions? And no one raises their hand. And he starts to walk out, and Rex says, Coach, I got one question. Okay, what is that? He says, do you win all the time because you get the best talent? Now, I can't tell you what Belichick said because they would throw me out of here, but he said no with something in front of it. Use your imagination. He said, what I do is I only bring people on my team who's willing to give it their all when it's not convenient for them to do so. Think how powerful that is. And if you go back and look at the teams and the people that they trade for and they get, or the superstars he doesn't put up with because he understands the kind of impact it's going to have on his entire team or ruin the culture that they have. So that has to apply internally first and then think about it, going above and beyond. We call it discretionary effort. Discretionary effort is the difference between just doing enough and keeping your job versus what you're truly capable of delivering. That gap is maybe that 3% or the Sergeant Major in Fort Knox at 10%, but whatever it is, that's what you wanna give to each other, give to your clients, uh, and really just try to live your life like that. Adaptability, AQ. This is, I think, the single most important cultural element of Carson today, is we don't defend what we know, we don't defend what we're comfortable with. This helps us break out of the prison of conventional thinking and wisdom to say, you know what, today's a brand new day. All the stuff that we believe in the past, is subject to change. And if you think technological change has been fast up to this point, it's barely even started. It's been a trickle and the avalanche is near. And for you, those of you in the room, I was having this conversation with some young professionals the other day. They're like, well, but I'm used to it. I'm used to all this technology. Yeah, well, you're used to this technology. <laughs> you can't even imagine the stuff that's coming. I go to Singularity University, which is in Palo Alto, California. 
They bring, by the way, there's a book you should read called Exponential Organizations. If you want to get your mind wrapped around how fast the change is actually going to take place, change like Singularity says that within 10 years, no one's going to die of natural causes anymore. Can you imagine the kind of impact that would have? You know, what kind of technologies would actually drive that? And we make a lot of investments, me personally, and some with the Carson company in FinTech, so we can see what's percolating beneath the surface, and it's really cool stuff. And this is why small companies disrupt large companies, because we have clean stack technology, we're not having to put it on top of legacy systems, but someday Carson will be a legacy company. Someday, Carson will not be in business, Union Pacific will not be in business, TD will not be in business, Amazon will not be in business. Can anybody name a company that was in business 200 years ago It's in business today? Neither. So my job as a CEO and a leader is to defer that as long as I possibly can. Innovative. We need to be innovative all the time. There's a lady by the name of Abby Johnson. She's the CEO of Fidelity. They're one of, the, they're one of our partners. And I was having breakfast with her and we were trying to hire a chief innovations officer. And I said to Abby, I said, where did you find your chief innovations officer at? And she goes, we don't have a chief innovations officer. Innovation is everybody's responsibility. And so we quit looking. We were having a hard time, and so we charged our organization with innovation. We need to innovate for our clients. None of you knew, and true, we listen to our partners, and, and we, we are bottoms up innovation, top down execution, so we need to listen. Don't get too far away from the client. Have a way that you can be directly belly to belly with the people you're serving, even as a leader. Never, ever lose that. But you need to be innovative and in thinking about things that your clients don't even know that they want. How many of you, your older ones in the room at least, knew you wanted an iPhone before it existed? Right? We didn't know it was possible. Well, I didn't know. Did you really know it was possible for an iPhone? You had that old dial. I grew up where we had a party line. Imagine this, we had to dial the phone, pick up, it had a special ring, and I could hear four other families on the line, right? Because we shared it with four other families. I know, it seems a little wild. I remember my first cell phone took up three quarters of the trunk of my car. It was $4,000, right? I go, wow, this is living, because I don't have to go find a phone booth now and go get dimes, you know, to make calls. We also charge innovation with our internal stakeholders. We have Rice Innovation Series. Tanner, I think you were actually there. Yeah, Tanner Butler's actually interned to hire. I think today's your first day officially, right, at Carson? So tremendous success story. For those of you that are interested in what internship is like, Tanner would be a, be a great resource for that. But we had, I believe, Emily, 58 submissions? 58 submissions, 58 unique ideas on how we could improve productivity, improve the client experience. We gave $5,000, potential to win $5,000 per idea. We have seven, and now it'll see about, we, we selected seven, we'll see how the implementation actually goes. And then GSD, just get stuff done. That's the PG version, right? We are known in our profession and with our partners that we move at the speed of light. Now, sometimes moving fast doesn't make sense. Sometimes you have to pause. Sometimes a moment of thinking is worth hours and hours of doing. I'll give you a great example of you need to get stuff done, but sometimes you have to just think before you move. So where we are harvesting, just, um, just uh, north of Blair, Nebraska, and we, my dad and I quit that night. We had an auger wagon. We had it full of beans, and overnight the auger wagon sunk down to where we couldn't get it out. The tractor it just was, was immovable. And, um, and so we go to town and we get a four-wheel drive tractor and we get chains and we're trying to, trying to get this thing pulled out and a farmer pulls up on the road. And he goes, boy, it looks like you guys are really stuck there. Yeah, we are. He said, uh, why wouldn't you just pull the grain truck up, empty the grain, and then just drive it out? My dad like, oh my gosh, I feel so stupid right now. We just spent three hours GSD in it, right? We're going as fast as we can to get stuff done because we got to get our crop out. Or if we had just paused and thought about it, it would have been okay. So follow up. Do what you say you're going to do. Manage expectations. Do that internally with the people you work with. And also when you look externally to the people that you're serving. These are core values that we, that we live every day. 
Let me talk about Omaha for a minute. How, oh, show of hands, how many of you are actually from this area? All right. Hopefully you'll stay in this area. We are making a huge commitment to Omaha. The fact I grew up in Nebraska, I love Nebraska, and I can tell you, I was in Dallas yesterday, I was in Austin, Jacksonville, Charlotte, Raleigh, you name it, I've been there. I was on the road 301 days last year, so I travel a lot. There's no place like Nebraska. There's just no place like Nebraska, and I'm not saying that because I'm from here. And we're making, this is a 200,000 square foot office complex, this is out on Dodge Street, the new development, I think it's around 144th and Dodge. We can um, build another 80,000 square feet for 280, but this should take care of cars for like the next 20 plus years. My point in telling you that is we're building a 100 year firm. In this day and age where people are building, some, building something to hurry up and sell it to make a quick buck, that's okay. But that's not what this is all about. This is us, Carson being here and having an impact locally, nationally, and globally, a lot of what we do, we're very giving. The clients that we serve are very charitable minded and they're doing some great things within our community as well. And there's another reason for this is we have a shortage of financial advisors. In the mid 90s, there was 550,000 financial advisors. Today, there's 288,000 financial advisors. Of the 288, 111,000 are close to retirement. We call them rich and tired. <laughs> they made a lot of money, but they don't have the energy and the next downturn in the market, which we'll have, it's inevitable, it's a healthy part of what we do, and it cleanses for the next upturn, but also lots of regulation. We need more regulation, believe it or not, in financial services. I can't, those business owners out there say, you know, are you crazy? Uh, no, we do need harmonization. So the investing public knows that there's just one standard, and it's a fiduciary standard for the consumer. But we are gonna have intern to hire, Carson University, um, our partner academy, we're, we're into continuous training and really growing our own for the future. When I travel around the country, I tell people that Omaha is the center of the universe. The work ethic is incredible. And Iowa and the surrounding area, the work ethic, the care factor. I say, you know what? People can work as hard as us, but no one's going to ever out care us because our internal stakeholders truly care. And I'll also talk about the fact that some of you come from places like California or New York and they think Nebraska's behind. But here's the truth about Nebraska. Nebraska is so far ahead that it looks like we're behind. You know that pebble that goes in and by the time it gets to the coast, they're doing something, we're already on to the next thing, right? We're the true leaders here, right here in the middle of the universe. One of my favorite sayings, and I have a thing, um, by the way, it's just a little weird, I know, but in my shower, I have all of my goals laminated. I have my daily affirmation. I have 27 of them. One of them is this. You haven't failed until you quit trying. Matter of fact, failure is a good thing. Failure is a learning process. Fail fast. Learn from it. Do, don't do the same thing over and over again. If you want to double your success rate, double your failure rate. I'm not good at sitting on big com uh, committees because it takes forever to make a decision. I can make three or four decisions and know three or four things that don't work before someone else even tries a singular thing. So don't be afraid to fail. View failure as a positive. I would open it up. I'm gonna, I know I've got five minutes left. I would entertain a question or two and then I just have a couple of closing remarks. Any questions from the audience? Don't be shy. Yes. Hey, are you going to bring a microphone we, around? You're on it. Yeah. All right. Well, it says Q&A. So I'm supposed to go with q and I'll repeat the question. Okay. I, I got it. The question was, how has mentors impacted me and my life? Huge impact. Uh, because they've already been there, they've done it. I'm in an organization called YPO, Young Presidents Organization, and I know I, I'm not young, but I think I'm young, uh, but it's been a fantastic, and if you can get into a YPO, and there's some other similar organizations, there's an amazing peer, let's call it PIN mentor, mentoring, 
And a lot of them are older than you. When I first went in in 1994, I was the youngest one in, and then I became the oldest one, and now I'm in a thing called gold, whatever that is. But um, it's for the old people, right? Um, and I would argue I probably have more ideas today than I ever had then. And then find people that are in the community, and most of them will give you some time to mentor. I mean, I love getting on the phone with a young you know, person that's thinking about the future. Many of you have actually connected with me on LinkedIn, and with some of you, I've had actual conversations you know, about your future. So mentoring is, is a big part of success, because why go make the same mistake? Many of you don't have kids yet, but it's like when you have kids, you're like, oh boy, I've already been through this, but so often we gotta make the mistake ourselves before we really learn it. So go into a mentor and say, you've already been it, you've already been successful, Please tell me how it is. As a pilot, we do this all the time. You know, we're flying along, we got our radar, and I'm like, I'm checking ahead. Who's at my altitude? You know, especially if weather's bad, 40 or 50 miles. And I say, hey, we're getting through just fine, or it's really rough, you should divert around. I was like, that's great information, because I know if they're experiencing that right then, they're ahead of me. And that's the same thing in your life career, in your path. Go learn from others that have already been there. But also do some due diligence. Right? Don't take advice from someone that either hasn't followed their own advice or hasn't had success with it. Any other questions? Yes, sir. You talked about the farm crisis and when your dad told you he couldn't take care of you and how that was a scary place. To today, what extent does fear still motivate you today? Fear, that's a good, it doesn't, but that's a recent phenomenon. I had to work with a therapist actually for a long time because I ran from scarcity a lot because when you're a kid and you have something like that happen to you, it, it changes the way you think about everything. And I've just, just in the you know, more recent history, just felt like, okay, I don't have to run from scarcity anymore. I'm not gonna you know, wake up one day and be without. Uh, but it, it was, I think it was a po powerful motivator throughout my life, I think in part, it's responsible for a lot of the success I had because I was very driven. You know, in the first at least decade of my professional career, I didn't really enjoy it. I didn't have any fun. I purely worked out of, out of fear. G great question, by the way. Any other questions? Yes. What's your favorite book? Favorite book. I got a bunch of them, but I'm going to give you one that uh, I re-listened to. It's called Nap Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich. Na anybody heard of it in the room? A handful? It's like, getting, it's like getting a business degree from Harvard. I mean, it is the best, best advice. Yeah, there's a lot of books that I love, but I'm a voracious reader. Here's an app. How many of you heard of Blinkist? Blinkist app. It's awesome. For like 70 bucks a year, you can have access to all these books. And what they do in a really interesting way, they give the heart of the, the meaning of the book. And so I think this year I'm up to 300 and some books that I've listened to on Blinkist. So uh, I recommend that as well. I'll take one more question and then, yeah. Well, obviously today you've given us just amazing insight and uh, kind of advice to kind of guide our future. What's something that you've heard before in your life that kind of helps shape what you become today from either a mentor or just someone in your life? Yeah, I'm going to go back to um, Howard Hawks. Howard Hawks is one of the most incredible human beings that ever lived, and he's a great gift to Omaha. Um, and that is surround yourself with good people. And don't think you figured it out. The older I get, the more I know I don't know. And that's a real healthy position to be in. And as a leader, give credit, don't take credit, even if it is your idea. Let me just leave you with this. How many in the room have actually won a Powerball lottery, the winning ticket? Anybody? What if I told you you all have? And you haven't won just one, you've won several. Do you know what the odds were for you to be a mammal? I don't know either, but they were astronomical. <laughs> I actually had someone calculate this for me. It was a number. You guys are probably smart enough to figure it out. I wasn't. Then on top of that, a human, a mammal, a human. In the United States of America, your third Powerball, at this time of history. And the fact that you're with one of the greatest universities ever, and I mean that from the bottom of my heart, the quality of the people that come out of Creighton, you've been blessed to have 
a great education. Do you realize a worse off person in the US is better off than 86% of the world? You have an opportunity to make a difference. It's your generation that I have great hope for that's going to pull our country back to the center. We all have way more in common than have differences. I don't care what your political beliefs are. And our country is being run by the extremes today. But because of availability of information, you're motivated by different things, like meaning. Like People work at Carson. They want to make paid fairly, but they want to do work that's super meaningful. So you've been given this. Now you ought to do is go cash the tickets. Persist without exception. Find a way when there is no way. See, life's riches don't come from vague wishes. They come from directed, purposeful action. You want to get to the end and say, I'm glad I did. Not that I wish I had. Never have the opportunities to succeed been greater today and have a positive impact on your local, national, and global communities. Thank you very much.